Hey folks, Andy Patton here to preview Gonzaga's big bout with the San Francisco Dons on Thursday night. Also going to answer a few more mailbag questions and make some WCC predictions for this upcoming week, all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. I want to thank all of you who make this podcast your first listen of the day, and of course, those of you who have checked out the show on YouTube. If you have not made it over to the YouTube channel yet, now is a great time to do so. You can see my new office background. You can check out the show multiple different locations. Hit that subscribe button. If you have not already, just go to youtube.com, search Locked on Zag, subscribe to all of our video content right there. Sincerely appreciate it. All right, we are talking Dons today. It's, of course, WCC Wednesday, so every segment today is themed around the WCC. Of course, Gonzaga's got a big game on Thursday at 8 p.m., against San Francisco, one of the 40 best teams in the country, a team that looks primed to potentially make the NCAA tournament as an at-large bid, something that has not happened to a non-St. Mary's or BYU team in the WCC in a very, very long time. So this is an exciting time for Todd Golden's squad. They've been very, very good this year. Uh, they're 15-3. and three. On the season right now, Ken Palm has them number 36 in the country. They floated kind of right in that mid-30s range throughout the year. Uh, They were one of the final remaining undefeated teams before they lost three of their games somewhat recently. Not really any bad losses. The worst loss is to Grand Canyon. That was their first loss. Grand Canyon is a good team, a good whack team, but you know they're they're right around the edge of being a Ken Palm top 100 team. So it's it's not a great loss. I was happy to see San Francisco. They lost the front end of back to backs between Grand Canyon and Arizona State, and they responded to the loss to Grand Canyon by still turning around and beating a good Pac-12 opponent in the Sun Devils. So that was really nice to see this squad be able to bounce back and win a game like that. Their second loss was to Loyola Chicago, an elite mid-major team, a team better than them, one of the 25 best teams in the country. This game came together last minute when San Francisco had some cancellations. I believe it was actually the Gonzaga game that was canceled that allowed them to schedule the Ramblers. They played at a D2 gym in Utah on a neutral site at the last minute. It was a really close, fun, exciting game. Again, really tremendous hats off to Golden and that whole staff over there for being able to find a way to make this game happen. It's a bummer that it's a loss, but it's a definite definition of a good loss. They proved that they're just as capable as the best mid-major program not named Gonzaga or BYU in the country. So it was really cool to see them play that game. It was a bummer they lost it, but still a really nice game for them. And then their third loss was to BYU, a really close one. Jamari Bouye's buzzer beater rimmed out, and that's what cost them the game. So proving once again that they are right in that conversation alongside BYU, who's a borderline top 25 team, alongside Loyola Chicago, who's been right around that top 25 team. So a really nice resume so far for San Francisco. No like super elite wins, but they have a lot of good wins. They beat Davidson, they beat Nevada, they beat UNLV and Fresno State. They really did a number on the Mountain West. Those kind of mid-level Mountain West teams beat all three of those guys. Of course, Arizona State, which was mentioned previously. And they defeated LMU in one of their other WCC games. LMU has been a bit of a disappointment this year, kind of a lot of expectation that they'd be in that top four or five conversation. They're sixth right now, so they're not that far outside of it, but it feels like there's a pretty good gap between Santa Clara and LMU. And at the time, it kind of seemed like LMU would be a little bit closer to the top five of the conference and San Francisco beat them pretty handily, uh, took care of business in that one. So really, really nice season so far. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. We've been hyping up San Francisco on this podcast for a very long time. Uh, They have the potential to make this a four-bid WCC. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the second segment. There's still a lot of work to be done for that to happen. 
Uh, it's going to be difficult to get all four teams in the conference, but San Francisco right now looks like right they're right in that conversation for the second best team in the wcc the the competition between byu and st mary's and san francisco is going to be tight all year long i think right now you have to give the nod to byu because they've beaten both san francisco and st mary's so that certainly gives them a bit of an edge there but like i said it was a buzzer beater for uh, the game against san francisco so they're right in that conversation they're averaging about 78 points per game which is 58 in the country they're giving up 65 and a half points per game which is 95th in the country so again they're top 100 team in both categories ken palm ranks them 60th on offense and 24th defensively which is much higher than the points per game they're giving up so kudos to them they're shooting 36 percent from three as a team and 47.6 percent from the field as a team which is 13th in the country so again we've talked about todd golden a handful of times one of the things that, that makes him such an elite coach uh, and, and good leader of that program is he has a very analytics heavy approach. And I think there's a lot of coaches that are attempting to do more analytics heavy approaches and the ones that are finding success in it are the ones who can really get their team to buy into it. And that is something that golden has seemed to really succeed with his players. I have bought in to this kind of mantra that they have. And again, 40, for just under 48% from the field as a team is really good. So that's a big credit to them. They're led, of course, by Jamari Bouye, absolute stud combo guard for this team. He averaged 17 points last year, so it's not like he's completely was completely off the radar heading into the season, but this year he's averaging 18 points, five rebounds, just under four assists per game. He's shooting 51.3% from the field, which for a guard, a, a high volume guard is obviously elite, and he's shooting 40.6% from three, so just an all around knockdown shooter, an elite scorer at all three levels. He's not a super big guy, 6'2, 180, so he might be somebody that, that struggles a little bit against some of the bigger, more physical guards. Uh, Gonzaga doesn't really have that. They have some decent-sized guards, obviously, but I don't know that they're going to be able to bully him too much. He's also averaging just under a block a game, so kudos to him for being able to block shots on the defensive end of the floor, especially for a smaller guy. Bouye is also... Got two other great guards in the program alongside him, Khalil Shabazz and Gabe Stefanini. Shabazz is averaging 12.5 points per game, three rebounds, 2.3 assists. He has not shot it well this year, though. I think he's a better player than he has showed, and if he continues to come around, this team could get even better than they've already been this season. He's taking 6.4 three-point attempts per game, but he's knocking them down at less than 30% clip. So if he gets hot and shoots it well, they're going to be a real menace uh, for for everybody in the conference, including Gonzaga. Stefanini is averaging eight points, two assists, shooting 35% from three. And then they have Julian Rishwain as well, their fourth guard. Rishwain is a 48.5% three-point shooter, so an elite knockdown outside shooter. That is not bad at all to have for your fourth guard. And then beyond that, I think the biggest thing, quite literally, for San Francisco is the fact that they have some size. They're one of the very few teams with actual size in the WCC. Uh, Misalski is their second best player behind Bouye. He's been outstanding for them in the front court, averaging 14 points, eight rebounds, 2.3 blocks per game. San Francisco is actually averaging the most blocks per game in conference play. That is a head of Gonzaga so far through the first couple of games. So this is a very, very good shot blocking team. Masalski shoots 62% from the field. His biggest weakness, he is a 46% free throw shooter. So if there is some, some challenges in this game and Gonzaga is struggling to stop them in the paint or struggling to give up points, fouling Masalski is far from the worst thing that they could be doing because that is not an area of strength for him. Beyond that, they don't have a lot of other really elite scoring big men but they have just a lot of other big guys duke transfer patrick tape is probably the most notable one he's averaging four points four boards he's six nine they have josh coonan who's six foot eight zane meeks six foot nine and then they have a couple european guys mark Ovetsky and reuni mark Ovetsky is seven one reuni is six nine all of these guys play in the rotation so again a lot of six eight a lot of six nine guys uh, Masalski is 6'10", obviously Mark, Mark Ovetsky is 7'1", so they have some size, and they're one of the few teams, like I said, that really does. I don't think that, again, you know, this, the, the, none of these players are, you know, Anton Watson level outside of Masalski. Like, he's he's their dude, and after that, it kind of it falls down a little bit. But still, most other teams don't even have this many guys who are this size. So 
So they have the ability to kind of put big bodies in front of Drew Timmy around Chet Holmgren. I think, you know, Drew and Chet have proven they can score on even good shot blockers. So I don't think that it's going to be a huge problem in this game. But this foul, the strategy of fouling Drew Timmy uh, is something that USF might be able to pull off a little bit better because they have enough big bodies that they can kind of cycle through some potential foul trouble. So we'll see how this game plays out. I'm really excited about it. Thursday morning, we will have a, an, another podcast talking about my five things to watch specifically for this game. And we'll definitely talk about how the big men are, are defended by USF, how they handle the scoring from Jamari Bouye and all of that stuff. Because I think this has the potential to be one of the trickiest games for Gonzaga and coming off you know, their first three games in the conference where they did not struggle at all, scored over 110 points and blew the doors off all three of those teams. I would be pretty surprised if that's the result we see here from this team on Thursday night. All right, quick primer on the Dons before Thursday's game. In the second segment, I'm going to answer two more spillover mailbag Monday questions that are related to the WCC and related to San Francisco specifically. But before we get there, let's talk about Bilt Bar. It's the new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure to include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it, unlike other protein bars which can be chalky or waxy or taste like a chemical spill. You want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. By now, you probably are thinking this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? But Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, here's an idea for the new year. Go to all of your secret treat stashes. At home, in the pantry, at the office, in the car, wherever. Throw out all of the sugary or calorie-filled treats and replace them with Built Bars. So when you're craving a snack or a treat, you can reach for something that's healthy and tastes incredible. Even if you're not a huge fan of working out, you can at least eat something that tastes good and is good for you. That way, when you enjoy a delicious Built Bar, you can almost count it as a workout. Go to BuiltBar.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, segment two. Still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, and we're still getting through the large amount of Mailbag Monday questions that were asked this week, answered a bunch of questions on Monday, answered a few more on Tuesday. Now we got two more related to the WCC to answer in segment two here. This first question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, I watched the entirety of the USF versus BYU game, and the end was brutal with Bouye's last second shot falling just short of a buzzer beater. It's brutal for USF fans, not as brutal for, for BYU fans, who I'm sure were happy to see that go down. Uh, he goes on, Joe Lenardi had the Dons in as a 10 seed in the latest installment of Bracketology, with the potential lack of quad one wins be a problem for the Dons. Might be a good time to discuss the importance of quad one wins in general. So yeah, it could be. I think this is a, this is a reasonable concern to have with San Francisco. If they don't beat Gonzaga... If they don't beat BYU in the second time that they play each other, that that like I said, their schedule is good. They have a lot of good quality wins, like the three wins against the Mountain West, Arizona State, but no no great wins, no super signature wins. Beating Loyola Chicago would have been a huge huge win for the Dons in the non conference slate. Obviously, beating BYU would have been a huge win for this team as well. Both games that were very close to victories. They were right within striking distance of both of those teams. So to go over on those two games really does hurt. The fact that they don't really have any bad losses. Again, Grand Canyon's not a great loss, but it's far from the worst loss they could have as well, I think will help their cause. But they they don't have a lot more wiggle room at this point. Even though they're a top 40 team in the comp in per Ken Palm, even though they they have what looks like the, the type of resume that would play they just, they're not going to have the strength of schedule. Unfortunately, the WCC is still going to punish them a little bit there, especially if they don't beat Gonzaga, if they don't beat BYU. Uh, I think if they lose all four of those games and they lose in the WCC conference tournament to either of those two teams. So if they lose five games to those two teams, it's probably over. Uh, I, I Even if they go perfect the rest of the way, they sweep St. Mary's, they beat every other team in the WCC. If they don't beat Gonzaga, don't beat BYU and don't make it to the WCC championship game. That's probably not the resume is probably not going to be strong enough. So they got 
they got some work to do. Uh, they're they're good. They know that they're going to be hungry, hungry, hungry to defeat Gonzaga on Thursday because they know that that's the kind of win that that cements their resume as potentially being in the NCAA tournament. Next question on a very similar line. This one comes from Mike Curtis at Upper Ninety Five Two One Five on Twitter. He says that the next three, as in USF, BYU, and St. Mary's, only lose to each other and Gonzaga. How many games can each team lose and still have all four make the tournament? And then he says his follow-up question, if either of those three teams lose to a non-top four WCC team, does that immediately dash their large chances? At-large chances, excuse me. If so, would beating the Zags again make them an at-large team? Okay, lots of different stuff to go over here. Uh, I'll go through one by one. We'll start with San Francisco because I already kind of talked on them in this first question, so we'll just give it a little bit more detail. I think USF has the smallest leash, unfortunately. Them and St. Mary's have pretty similar resumes. St. Mary's has better wins. They beat Oregon. That was a, that helped them. They beat Notre Dame. That helped them. They almost beat Wisconsin. It would have been huge if they pulled off that victory, especially with how Wisconsin is playing right now. But even the fact that they played Wisconsin really, really close, I think is going to help them. San Francisco just doesn't have any of that. Like we said, they have some good wins and not really any bad losses. But they're going to they're gonna rack up a few more losses. Probably not any bad losses. Hopefully not for them. But I think that their wiggle room is very, very very small, borderline non-existent. I think if USF loses to any team that's not Gonzaga, BYU, St. Mary's, they they can maybe get one. And if they get one, they have to beat BYU that second time. They have to sweep St. Mary's. If they lose to Gonzaga twice and they lose to like Santa Clara once or you know, San Diego once, somebody like that, and they don't lose any other games except to Gonzaga, it's going to be tight. It's going to be really tight at that point. They're really going to need some of those other bubble teams to lose a lot of games because I don't know that they're going to, they're, they're not a shoe in at that point. They have to be perfect against every team worse than them in the WCC. And they got to be pretty dang good. They got to probably sweep St. Mary's. Maybe they can split with the Gales. If they beat BYU that second time, if they split with St. Mary's split with BYU, lose to Gonzaga, don't lose to anybody else. That's probably a good enough resume. But again, this is obviously really difficult to fully answer because we don't know how some of those bubble teams are going to do. We don't know how many teams. The Mountain West right now is trending towards two, maybe three, but I could see three or four sneaking in from that conference. The Pac-12 is kind of cannibalizing itself, as it always does, but there's a chance for a team to you know rattle off a nice three or four game win streak in the, in the middle of the regular season enough to, to put them in that conversation for an at-large bid as well. So USF is going to be really tough. St. Mary's has a pretty similar, similar volatility level. I think again, they have a bit more of a leash because they've been to the tournament recently. And that, that does matter whether it should or not is up for debate, but it does matter. Randy Bennett's a team that's taken St. Mary's to the NCAA tournament before people will acknowledge that when they're looking at making the, the selection committee, when they're looking at making the brackets. Uh, but again, they also have the the wins over Notre Dame, the wins over Oregon, which is the Oregon win is looking better and better because Oregon beat UCLA and USC last week. It looks like a team that's going to do a lot of good work through the Pac-12 this year. I think St. Mary's is the most likely team to lose to a non-top four team in the WCC just because of the volatility of their team. They play such a slow pace. They don't give up a lot of points, but if they're not shooting efficient with the basketball, they can not score very many points. They're capable of scoring like 45, 50 points against just about anybody if they're not shooting it really well. So I could definitely see them falling to a Santa Clara, falling to an LMU, maybe even falling to one of the other four teams in the conference that are not as good, a Pacific, a San Diego, that kind of team as well. If they do that, and they only split with BYU and they split with USF and they split with Gonzaga or they lose to Gonzaga twice, that's probably going to push them right on the outside of the edge. Again, they still might sneak in, but this is a team that I could see reasonably getting swept by BYU. I think it's likely they get swept by Gonzaga. At that point, if they don't beat USF twice and they lose one other game, they're probably out. I think they're going to I think they're probably going to sneak in if I had to bet. But I, they're right on that border too. And again, they're they're just so volatile as a team. It's hard to know because they really are capable of losing to anybody. They're capable of beating anybody too. I don't want to just back on them. They've proven that they can beat really good teams with the strategy that they run. They've beat Gonzaga by 
slowing the pace down to a snail's pace and, and just beating them that way. So they can do it, but I would not be surprised to see them drop a game that they should not drop this year and have it put them right on the border. And then BYU, I think, has the biggest leash, uh, without a doubt, in my mind. They have a lot of good wins. Yeah, they got the doors blown off of them by Gonzaga, but that game said a lot more about Gonzaga than it did about BYU. Again, this BYU team was really efficient scoring the basketball in the first half, still put up 84 points, just got absolutely reamed by Gonzaga's offense and drew Timmy in the second half in particular. But again, they have wins over St. Mary's and USF, so the worst they'll do against those two teams is split. I think it's pretty reasonable to expect that they could actually sweep both of those. If they do that, they're in almost certainly they would have to lose a lot of really bad games in the WCC for them to not make it if they sweep St. Mary's and USF. Uh, Even if they split with both those teams, if they lose all three of their remaining big games, they lose to Gonzaga, they lose to USF, they lose to St. Mary's, but they don't lose any other WCC games. So just those three games, I think they'll still get in. Again, it depends how they do in the WCC tournament, but if they, even if they lose a game there, and so they don't make the championship or they lose in the championship to Gonzaga. They still have the win over St. Mary's. They still have the win over USF. They still have all their good non-conference wins. They're still top 25. You know, right now they're right on the border of being a top 25 team per Ken Palm. So I think even if they get, get uh, splits, excuse me, with St. Mary's and USF, I think they're still going to get in. I think they're the most likely team to make it. Uh, but I think St. Mary's has a decent chance too. And I think USF does too. They just, they, there's not a lot of leash. And I think, you know, we, we look at other conferences, the PAC 12 in particular has a big habit of cannibalizing itself. The teams that aren't considered tournament caliber teams beat the teams that are considered tournament caliber teams and hurt those teams seeding and, and potentially knock some of those teams out. It's weird because we want to root for the whole WCC to be better. So in theory, it's good if Santa Clara is capable of beating those teams. But the problem is when they do that, it's potentially going to like USF has so little wiggle room that they cannot lose a game to San Diego. They cannot lose a game to LMU. And if they do, it, it, it almost, I don't want to say it certainly knocks down their tournament chances, but it dashes them pretty significantly. So we have to root for these top four teams to continue to do really good things against the rest of the conference. If we want to have multiple bids into the, into March madness. All right. Third segment coming up. We're going to look at the WCC schedule as a whole this week make some predictions for how these games are going to go. Before we get there, though, let's talk about NetSuite. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business with poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system out there to power your company's growth. With visibility and control of your finances, inventory, HR needs, planning, budgeting, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow as a company all in one convenient location. NetSuite lets you automate your processes and close your books in no time while keeping you ahead of your competition. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and right now through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA head to netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA for special end of the year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That's netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA. All right. Segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still WCC Wednesday. So of course we're still looking at the rest of the conference here in this segment. I'm going to do the same thing I did last week. I'm going to look at all of the games coming up on Thursday and Saturday, make some predictions for how I think those games are going to go. I'm also going to keep track so we see how I'm doing last week. I went 3-0 and on Thursday, so hopefully can keep that tradition alive. Uh, the first game coming up on Thursday is San Diego at BYU. BYU at the Marriott Center against one of the not top four teams. I got to pick a win here for the Cougars. Uh, San Diego's not bad. By any stretch of the imagination, but I they don't have I just they just don't have the horses to hang with BYU. I think this BYU team is primed to do a lot of good work in conference play, and I really can't imagine them losing a game at home to anybody other than Gonzaga or maybe San Francisco. Uh, Santa Clara at St. Mary's is next. Uh, I'm going to take St. Mary's, but I think this is going to be a close, 
close game here. Uh, St. Mary's is at home. That's always an advantage, even against Santa Clara, who's not far away from home. Santa Clara is obviously an extremely talented team with Jalen Williams, with P.J. Pipes fully healthy and Yusuf Vrankic back. Uh, Vrankic is going to be a problem for St. Mary's, but again, they have the size to handle him. They have Dan Fotu. They have Matthias Toss, two big dudes who are good defensive players, good rebounders. Uh, but Jalen Williams is going to be a problem for them as well. He's such an elite scorer. He's a good outside shooter. He's good at getting to the rim. They have Keyshawn Justice, a 45% three-point shooter. If that if he's shooting well from the outside, if P.J. Pipes is penetrating well, uh, they could definitely give them some problems. I, I'm, I'm far from confident that St. Mary's wins this game. I think this is probably one of their toughest opponents just based on the matchups and based on the fact that Santa Clara is, is fully healthy right now. But I don't know that they can pull off that victory on the road. And then finally, we got Pepperdine at LMU. Sticking with all of the home teams for Thursday, I got to go LMU here. LMU has been a bit of a disappointment this year in WCC play. They got beat badly by San Francisco. They just haven't really lived up to the expectation as being kind of right on the cusp of being a top four, top five team in the conference. But they still got dudes. Eli Scott is outstanding. Damian Douglas is very, very good. And Pepperdine has just has just been bad. They're just not good anymore. With without Colby Ross, without Kessler Edwards, this is just not a team that's really prim- primed to do a lot of damage. And I don't see them picking up picking up a lot of signature road victories in conference play. Moving on to Saturday. Last Saturday, I was two and one, so five and five and one on the week last week. So hopefully, we can continue that uh, that level of success. Uh, San Diego at Pacific is the first game. Uh, this is also the first game where I'm picking the away team. Uh, Pacific and San Diego are probably pretty evenly matched, but Pacific has not played in a long time. Coming off a long COVID pause, uh, I think San Diego is going to take this one on the road uh, and and hand Pacific their first loss of the conference play. Next up, San Francisco at Pepperdine. Uh, Again, Pepperdine is not good, uh, and San Francisco is good, and I think San Francisco is going to lose on Thursday to Gonzaga, so I think they're going to be unhappy about that, and I think they're going to come in and blow the doors right off Pepperdine uh, down in SoCal. St. Mary's at LMU is next. Uh, Again, at LMU, St. Mary's playing on the road against one of the better non-top four teams in the WCC. Could be a close game, but LMU just hasn't impressed me enough to believe that they have the firepower to beat St. Mary's. Uh, St. Mary's slow, plodding, methodical offense is probably – going to be enough to keep LMU from scoring too many points. And if St. Mary's is decently efficient, I think they'll win that one as well. And then we got Portland at BYU. Again, Portland picked up a road victory last week, which kudos to them for doing that. I I, I said that I didn't think they were going to be undef- or winless in conference play for too long, and they won their second conference game of the year. So hats off to Shante Leggins and that whole staff for securing a victory. But I don't think that they're at the point where they're going to be beating BYU at home anytime soon. I think BYU is going to take that one, and I think they're going to take that one by a pretty good margin. All right, we'll see how I did when we talk again next week. I'm super excited for this game on Thursday night, of course. Get your coffee ready for everybody. It's going to be a late one. Again, 8 p.m. tip on Thursday night. Can't wait to chat with you all on Twitter during the game. I'll have post-game reactions as soon as it's over. We'll have an episode tomorrow before the game as well, doing some Andy Locks. So get your quest- or your hot takes submitted to me as soon as you hear this, and we can talk about them on Thursday's show right here on the Locked on Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you have not already. Podcast links will also be available on Twitter at Locked on Zags and on my Twitter account, which if you do not follow me, you can find me at ScoreZagsScore. Finally, thank you again to those of you who make this show your first listen of the day. Now is a great time to make your second listen, the Locked on Bets podcast. Locked on Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all of your sports gambling needs. Locked on Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert insight and analysis from Lee Sterling. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags!